What regulations are at play when a country invests in stocks and businesses in another country? And who are those regulations ultimately benefiting? The 2008 global financial crisis changed how we think about the interconnection of different countries' finances and investments, and that interconnection's effects on each country both domestically and internationally. We continue to live in a world of nations intent on protecting themselves while also opening their doors to lucrative global trade and a certain amount of foreign investment. The 2008 financial crisis shone a spotlight on the winners and losers in that respect, resulting in greater regulation of foreign investment and how much could be borrowed or leveraged for those investments. Today's increasing inflation and interest rates reveal similar tensions in the relationship between nations' domestic economies and their international financial markets. Welcome to the Delve Podcast. I'm your host for this episode, Robin Fadden. On this episode, Desotel Faculty of Management Professor Francesca Carrieri discusses her research on the dynamics of global market integration, in particular, the details of foreign investment and current barriers to it, studying alternative financial integration measures, international capital flows, and institutional portfolio holdings. Carrieri and her co-researchers have shown how regulatory constraints on foreign investors' use of leverage can act as an international investment barrier. What level of risk will foreign investors take today in the name of diversification of their portfolios? And what barriers are holding them back, not only for their own sake, but for the integrity of any foreign country's domestic market? Welcome to the Delve Podcast, Professor Carrieri. I'd like to start with a question of curiosity. What main research question or gap in this research area of global financial integration and investment inspired your paper? We can say that a lot has changed for finance research after the financial crisis. A lot of research got directed toward looking at the role of intermediaries in financial markets, right? Because it was clear also that intermediaries had a large role in what happened then. So it made sense, right, to um, uh, add to our knowledge. And, and so in all areas, both domestic research and uh, international research, we started looking at uh, problems that were related to uh, financial intermediaries. I've been working on uh, international, international problem, international finance uh, for a long time. And so you can say that part of of my research agenda has always been uh, for a long time looking at what we say is international financial integration. Right? So how international financial markets move together. We, if, you, if you can broadly speak, right? Uh, or why do they move together? When, uh, when is it that they move together? What kind of risks makes them move together? So this is like the broad question I've always been interested with. And for Sometime, I would say my research was really focused on figuring out the role of what we say were investment barriers. We can think of it also what happens in, especially used to happen a lot in the past in Canada. Investor, domestic investor were not allowed to own foreign securities in large amount. There was just a small amount allowed, right, in their portfolio, whether these were institutional investors, also uh, retail investors. Now we are in a different world, right, where we all, also thanks to academics, I guess, we understand the benefit of being internationally diversified. And before that, why was international investment limited for Canadian and other international investors? A lot of it had to do with a sense of maybe protecting the investors, I would say. So this was on one side, so it was more on the domestic side that there was this, right, in terms of regulations. At the same time, it is also fair to say that for a long time, market countries around the world were also closed to foreign investments, right? So it was two ways. On one side, domestic Domestically, regulators wanted to uh, protect investors and wanted to, they say, maintain capital within its own countries uh, without regards for the fact that maybe allowing people, investors to go abroad had some advantages, right? Diversification, global diversification is, is the primary source of this advantage. So, and on the other side, also we said uh, countries were imposing restrictions on foreign 
capital coming in or going out. Some of it was maybe due to the, the desire to protect capital market internally because very often foreign capitals, as I said, is kind of fickle, right? So in some cases at the first note of stress uh, around the world, it might leave the country. And so that creates a bigger crisis than that how it starts. So there were all these different reasons for, and for that we didn't see a lot of international investments, but then slowly, slowly country regulators realized the importance of it. So countries open when we hear about liberalization, right? Liberalization of financial markets. Uh, what is that? It was exactly the fact that many countries uh, remove these restrictions primarily on ownership of some assets, of some industries, allowing foreign investors, recognizing that capital from foreign investment is important. And therefore, there was in the 90s among developed markets and in the 2000s also definitely expanded also to emerging markets. We saw, right, there was this broad trend across investors to also course, look abroad, look at foreign uh, investments. And that was facilitated, right? was facilitated by the fact that all these that we called barriers to international investment were falling. So that was, I would say, what my research had been for a long time, focusing on international financial integration, focusing on the existence of these barriers, focusing on the capital market liberalization, therefore the reduction of these barriers. And as as a result, focusing on how markets change in their correlation. This was the story before, I would say, the financial crisis. Then I, I, I was telling you how things overall in broadly in finance research, the focus of finance research changed somewhat with the financial crisis. So then the question with my co-author, we start thinking, it was like, okay, so clearly there's a lot of barriers to international investments that have been reduced, maybe even eliminated. So we might think that, hey, look, now there's absolutely no problem. If I can just boil it down in a very simple way, there's absolutely no problem into investing uh, abroad, whether we're talking about institutional investors, retail investors, no problem. Well, the question, however, is not so simple, right? So we started digging into the, the rules that are behind this foreign investment, and we focus more on certain aspects that were highlighted during the financial crisis. So we might have heard a lot that issues with leverage, right? The fact that financial institutions were highly levered, had heavily borrowed for investments had become one of the reasons, right, that triggered the financial crisis. So our question was, okay, can we say something about that? Uh, but now not focusing on uh, simply what happened within a domestic market, of course, the US or maybe or Canada, but actually see how that can impact uh, cross-border investment, whether or not these are uh, relevant barriers, whether first of all they exist and if they're relevant. How did you figure out how to measure cross-border funding barriers and how do cross-border funding barriers affect investment choices and asset prices? It wasn't easy to come up with a measure. In, in this paper, we actually come up with a more sophisticated way of modeling this. But to boil it down simply was really to figuring out whether there are risk restriction on using leverage for foreign position, to invest in foreign uh, securities. So while it is very clear and straightforward, when we think about an ownership restriction on a foreign security is very simple. It's either the government that says mm -mm, foreigners cannot involve and cannot buy stocks of airlines, for example, right? Or banks, right? Because these are some sectors that are protected. Or, uh, you know, companies in their charter, they say, no, no, we don't want foreign capital more than, you know, 20%. Again, for, that, for some reason, they want to protect their um, domestic investment. This was very, it's very clear and straightforward. Uh, when it comes to cross-border funding barriers, in a way we can say that, I don't want to say we came up with this language, but it, it, indeed the idea of funding barriers already existed, right, at the domestic level. So uh, you can think of what could be the reason why some institution cannot 
borrow or leverage their position, borrow to invest. So this idea of some kind of uh, frictions in, in borrowing for investments existed already, but there was not, uh, I would say, any understanding of uh, whether this matters and to what extent these uh, frictions might matter when it comes to investing abroad. The data for your research involves studying financial regulations and data around securities, as well as observing stock market prices and their dynamics. That's quite a lot of data. What did you focus on within that information? Well, one of the problems when, when we look at international financial market is, is data, data availability and data comparability. So if we want to do something that is meaningful, we need to have similar data across many countries. Otherwise, you know, it's not uh, very significant as a study. There are problems into achieving that. And so the first thing was like, okay, so which market do we want to start studying? And of course, we focus a lot on the regulations of the U.S. market because, as you might imagine, it represents the largest market for investors, both within the country and as investors investing abroad, right? Bringing their money, institutional investors bringing their money in other countries. So we started looking at that. You know, we also try to understand whether similar regulation is, exists, for example, in Canada or uh, in other countries. We don't have fully comprehensive data on this. That was the reason why we needed to come up with our own measure. And we verified whether this measure fits with the limited data that we can collect. And so this measure is actually a measure that we extract from financial, from asset prices, from, from prices of stocks. And we extract this measure, not only for the US, where we have some a sense of what the rules are when it comes to leverage, but we also extract this measure from all other countries around the world. And, and so this is our own extracted, yes, extracted measure of, of uh, cross-border funding barriers. And then we validate that measure with the limited data that we have extracted from the U.S. regulations. In your assessment, what has changed since the global financial crisis 14 years ago? Has anything shifted backwards? The thing was interesting for us to look at this is because on one side, when it comes to, as I said, some form of barriers, they have been reduced or completely eliminated, investment, foreign investment barriers. What has happened on instead on the leverage and uh, all those type of rules, they are still there. And in some uh, cases, they've actually been strengthened. Uh, because if it is the case that we observe some of the uh, problems during the financial crisis being driven by either a lack of regulations, a lack of oversights, and so on, that clearly justified looking at this again and strengthening these rules, strengthening the resilience of the of financial markets, and so on. With respect to rules, when it comes to leverage itself, we st these are still in in place. When it comes to some rules with respect to mutual funds and the opportunity for these uh, other institutional investors to actually look abroad, uh, those have been even strengthened because now there's, and I'm talking about the U.S. primarily, there are provisions with respect to um, liquidity risk management. So if uh, mutual funds have certain foreign stocks, they have to maintain a certain level of liquidity that depends on how the regulators look at these stocks, how risky they are, what what is the uh, sovereign countries or what is the currency of denomination? What is the jurisdiction? All these things have really been scrutinized more closely and in some new regulation have been uh, added or strengthened. So this matters to many different types of investors, from banks to brokerage firms to everyday people who have investments in mutual funds. Absolutely. So the, in the paper, we really go through all the investors and we really show how at every level this restriction matters. And we, we start with uh, with banks, so financial institutions in general and their capital requirements. Then we go down and we look at financial intermediaries that are regulated, like a brokerage and prime brokers. Then we look at hedge funds uh, that heavily use a leverage. Uh, and then we look at mutual funds. 
that cannot use leverage to protect the investors. And we also look at retail investors. So we show how constraint on leverage exists at every level. But we also say these, these constraints are not, they, they are there. This is a level of constraints, but they're not always bindings, right? They only become binding urgent under certain conditions when uh, financial markets are under stress. So credit becomes less available and therefore, you know, uh, prime brokerage uh, requires changing in their margin requirements or in their rules on how you can borrow funds to invest. I mean, it's clear in, in stressful periods, it makes sense to think that it becomes harder to borrow. When credit is easy, of course, there's no problem. But the moment markets become uh, more nervous, a lot of these margins accounts. So uh, how certain financial institutions provide borrowing credit for invest in, in other financial instruments becomes more difficult. And so that is basically what we were able to observe during the financial crisis. And that goes back to the integration stories that I th you, you had asked me earlier. So what has happened during the financial crisis is the moment credit becomes more scarce, uh, banks have to call in some of their uh, loans in terms of margins and so on. What you observe is that these constraints that exist all the time becomes binding. And therefore, this integration that exists between financial markets around the world decreases. If before uh, every country was equally risky, maybe this is a good way to put it, every country was equally risky in periods of stress, which, you know, in our this research were really motivated by this funding liquidity, lack of funding liquidity, in period of stress, countries take their own path. So risks is not equally shared around the countries. And we start seeing periods of stress in some countries more than other countries. Some countries are viewed as more risky than others. In, during period of calm, all markets kind of go together and risk is kind of uh, uh, equally uh, shared and priced around the world, then it starts diverging during period of stress. I mean, this is just broadly, you know, taking very broad, a broad explanation of this, of these events. What types of international investors are most affected by leverage constraints? It is broad in terms of when it comes to the regulation. But of course, because there are some investors like hedge funds or mutual funds that really represent a large portion of foreign, right, of cross-border investments, then we can say these things becomes really binding for this type of investors in terms of stress. Now, when it comes to retail investors, they're there and they're actually pretty, pretty binding. It's just that in general, uh, from the very beginning, retail investors find it very hard to uh, invest abroad. It would be even harder to really document it uh, empirically for a retail investor. So that's why we do it and we focus more in our empirical analysis on what we can learn from uh, the rules to institutional investors and to mutual funds. We know that the financial crisis was obviously a source of stress, which caused leverage constraints on some investors. How did those constraints drive up the cost or premiums of asset-related risk? I think I, I mentioned earlier that there is this level, this, this rules that always exist. These rules implies that if an, an institutional investor wants to um, invest abroad, so borrows, let's say an institutional in hedge fund wants to borrow on margin from a prime broker, wants to borrow some money to buy a foreign stock. There is a rule uh, there that tells that these margins uh, is more expensive than borrowing on margins for domestic stocks. So you can see how uh, the moment credit becomes more scarce, uh, necessarily uh, hedge funds, the first thing they would do is they would retreat from investing in what is more costly. And so that explains, right, why do we observe risk between asset to increase during this period of stress. And we say this risk, increase in risk, is really driven by the fact that there exists a level of investment barriers. This is, becomes binding during period of stress, and that explains why then uh, risk is reprised during this uh, period. Mm -hmm. 
One of your major research findings is that in periods of stress, certain investors will back off from foreign investments in particular. What do you see as the policy implications or other effects of your findings? Yes, is, is that in period of stress, when credit becomes more scarce, one of the first thing that becomes a reason to worry for, for institutional investors or mutual funds is the fact that they have foreign stocks on their, in their portfolio and the fact that they might pull back right from investment in these foreign stocks because of certain rules or another important aspect especially for mutual funds that cannot uh, use leverage is that to amplify their exposure to risk they pull toward what they're called high beta stocks uh, high beta stocks are stocks that we say that they have embedded leverage they help investors to amplify their exposure to markets without borrowing this is basically what we have observed, uh, do we provide some kind of policy uh, prescription? Well, the fact that we say that during these periods of stress, markets become more segmented, right, are not integrated, that really tells us that becomes harder for countries around the world to share risks. And so what we can do is just trying to strengthen the financial system overall. But I think in a way, as I said, certain things are, have been happening. The fact that there are all these liquidity risk provisions that have been introduced, again, is to make sure that under certain conditions, institutional investors have the liquidity necessary to strengthen their underlying positions, basically. When we look at what's going on today in global financial matters, where there's been talk since the beginning of the COVID pandemic about a possible recession and credit crisis, and more recently we've seen inflation and interest rate hikes, how does your research relate to broader problems like these, not necessarily in the economy in general, but in global financial markets? This research in itself is not directly linked to uh, a recession in the real economy, but is more directly linked to problem in financial markets. And, and if you want, definitely we can say that today as we see those two kind of going together, although it's, it's very hard, we know, to say, oh, we are in a recession. It's usually easier to see financial markets collapse or, you know, losing value, and only later we might learn about a recession and so on. So the research itself is not, like, once again, about uh, the real side of the economy, the research, the, the, the recession part these days, but it's about investment. And so what is the problem, for example, these days? What we observe is that we see interest rates increasing all across the boards. We know the central banks are fighting inflation everywhere around the world, and and that's part of their mandate, ensure price stability, it means that they have to increase interest rates. So increasing interest rates necessarily make things more costly. So borrowing at every level becomes more costly. And at the same time, a higher interest rate means that maybe some, at least maybe the retail investors would be less willing to invest in, uh, in stocks and even less maybe in foreign markets. So indeed, we really haven't seen this, the type of crisis that we observe in 2007, 2008, some people say because the financial structure has been strengthened through all this uh, additional regulation. So we're, we haven't seen that. Uh, so the type of market drops that we've seen le lately, I mean, like just last, right, yesterday, markets now today are a little bit more calm, if you want, are not really driven by the high exposure to leverage that caused instead the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, is definitely more driven by the underlying economic situations. But there's no doubt that higher interest rates always create stress for markets, create stress for credit availability, and so can also create problems for foreign investments. This research also shows how completely integrated the world is right now. Yes, we can separate financial markets from national economies and recessions and inflation, but we can also see how linked they really are today. Absolutely, yes. That's That was exactly. I, again, as I said, this is part of my general type of research, to think how integrated the world uh, is or is becoming. So I started right, looking in the 70s. Uh, that happened through first developed markets becoming more integrated. Then also emerging markets eliminated some barriers and some restriction. And then looking again at what happened in the 2007, 2008, when we all think, oh, my God, 
there's no more restriction. We can do whatever we want, invest abroad and so on. Basically, this paper said, wait, 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 wait. There's still some things that are out there that differentiates between a domestic type of investment and an international type of investment. And how we can fund this different type of investment clearly is different because the foreign investment is viewed by regulators as riskier, and therefore there are more guardrails, if you want. It is more difficult to borrow if you want to invest abroad. There are certain liquidity provisions that have to be maintained and so on. So yes, it's true, the world is more integrated, more correlated, but there's still things there. And maybe it's because regulators in each country wants to protect the integrity of its own financial markets and its own investors. And therefore, as long as we con- will continue to see domestic assets different from foreign assets, there will always be these tensions and possibility for dislocation in in financial integration driven by these type of uh, problems. So no country is going to stop watching what's going on in investments, both within their borders and by foreign investors. If anything, yes, that's what we learned uh, with with the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, Also at an international level, there are all this push to allow a a connection between financial markets in different countries, but also keep the integrity of the domestic market. So that the domestic remains safe. While so much is linked globally, we still live in a world of separate nations, of course. Yes, exactly. We still live in a world of nations, yes. Yes, and their own people to protect and their own markets to protect, their own companies to protect. And that's something that could be lost sight of when you're looking at the details of stock markets, ups and downs, where the financial world is perhaps more easily abstracted away from its tangible effects on people. Yes, yes. But behind that, right, there are people, there are people working in companies, and, and therefore that makes sense why regulation think about you know, what's behind just stock prices. Behind stock prices are investors of all kinds, of course, as well as companies and the people that run them and work for them the people that buy their goods and services, who hold workplace and government pension investments, who in some way or another are touched by the financial sphere. Our guest today on the Delve podcast was Desotel Faculty of Management Professor Francesca Carrieri, whose research provides an overview of both the importance of studying international investment through unbiased academic means and how safeguarding the domestic market through regulations affects foreign investment and greater global markets. You can find out more about this research in an article at delve.mcgill.ca. Thank you for listening to the Delve podcast, produced by Delve, the thought leadership platform of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. You can follow Delve McGill on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to the Delve McGill podcast on your favorite podcasting app.